book three chapter ten of the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry chapter ten a night hawk when the old commoner's private physician had gone and his mind had fully cleared he would sit for hours in the sunshine of the vine-clad porch asking elsie of the village its life and its people he smiled good-naturedly at her eager sympathy for their sufferings as at the enthusiasm of a child who could not understand he had come possessed by a great idea events must submit to it her assurance that the poverty and losses of the people were far in excess of the worst they had known during the war was too absurd even to secure his attention he had refused to know any of the people ignoring the existence of elsie's callers but he had fallen in love with marion from the moment he had seen her the cold eye of the old fox hunter kindled with the fire of his forgotten youth at the sight of this beautiful girl seated on the glistening back of the mare she had saved from death as she rode through the village every boy lifted his hat as to passing royalty and no one old or young could allow her to pass without a cry of admiration her exquisite figure had developed into the full tropic splendor of southern girlhood she had rejected three proposals from ardent lovers on one of whom her mother had quite set her heart a great fear had grown in mrs lenoir's mind lest she were in love with ben cameron she slipped her arm around her one day and timidly asked her a faint flush tinged marion's face up to the roots of her delicate blonde hair and she answered with a quick laugh mamma how silly you are you know i've always been in love with ben since i can first remember i know he's in love with elsie stoneman i am too young the world too beautiful and life too sweet to grieve over my first baby love i expect to dance with him at his wedding then meet my fate and build my own nest old stoneman begged that she come every day to see him he never tired praising her to elsie as she walked gracefully up to the house one afternoon holding hugh by the hand he said to elsie next to you my dear she is the most charming creature i ever saw her tenderness for everything that needs help touches the heart of an old lame man in a very soft spot i've never seen any one who could resist her elsie answered her gloves may be worn her feet clad in old shoes yet she is always neat graceful dainty and serene no wonder her mother worships her sam ross her simple friend had stopped at the gate and looked over into the lawn as if afraid to come in when marion saw sam she turned back to the gate to invite him in the keeper of the poor a vicious-looking negro suddenly confronted him and he shrank in terror close to the girl's side what you doing here sir the black keeper railed ain't i done told you about running away you let him alone marion cried the negro pushed her roughly from his side and knocked sam down the girl screamed for help and old stoneman hobbled down the steps following elsie when they reached the gate marion was bending over the prostrate form oh my my i believe he's killed him she wailed run for the doctor sonny quick stoneman said to hugh the boy darted away and brought dr cameron how dare you strike that man you devil thundered the old statesman cause i told him to stay home and do the work i put him at and he all the time running off here to get something to eat i gwine to frail the life out in him if he don't mind me well you make tracks back to the poor house i'll attend to this man and i'll have you arrested for this before night said stoneman with a scowl the black keeper laughed as he left not less you's a bigger man than that governor silas lynch you won't when dr cameron had restored sam and dressed the wound on his head where he had struck a stone in falling stoneman insisted that the boy be put to bed turning to dr cameron he asked why should they put a brute like this in charge of the poor that's a large question sir at this time said the doctor politely and now that you have asked it i have some things i've been longing for an opportunity to say to you be seated sir the old commoner answered i shall be glad to hear them elsie's heart leaped with joy over the possible outcome of this appeal and she left the room with a smile for the doctor 
first allow me said the southerner pleasantly to express my sorrow at your long illness and my pleasure at seeing you so well your children have won the love of all our people and have had our deepest sympathy in your illness stoneman muttered an inaudible reply and the doctor went on your question brings up at once the problem of the misery and degradation into which our country has sunk under negro rule stoneman smiled coldly and interrupted of course you understand my position in politics dr cameron i am a radical republican so much the better was the response i have been longing for months to get your ear your word will be all the more powerful if raised in our behalf the negro is the master of our state county city and town governments every school college hospital asylum and poorhouse is his prey what you have seen is but a sample negro insolence grows beyond endurance their women are taught to insult their old mistresses and mock their poverty as they pass in their old faded dresses yesterday a black driver struck a white child of six with his whip and when the mother protested she was arrested by a negro policeman taken before a negro magistrate and fined ten dollars for quote, insulting a freedman end quote. stoneman frowned such things must be very exceptional they are everyday occurrences and cease to excite comment lynch the lieutenant governor who has bought a summer home here is urging this campaign of insult with deliberate purpose the old man shook his head i can't think the lieutenant governor guilty of such petty villainy our school commissioner the doctor continued is a negro who can neither read nor write the black grand jury last week discharged a negro for stealing cattle and indicted the owner for false imprisonment no such rate of taxation was ever imposed on a civilized people a tithe of it cost great britain her colonies there are five thousand homes in this county two thousand nine hundred of them are advertised for sale by the sheriff to meet his tax bills this house will be sold next court day stoneman looked up sharply sold for taxes yes with the farm which has always been mrs lenoir's support in part her loss came from the cotton tax congress in addition to the desolation of war and the ruin of black rule has wrung from the cotton farmers of the south a tax of sixty seven million dollars every dollar of this money bears the stain of the blood of a starving people they are ready to give up or to spring some desperate scheme of resistance the old man lifted his massive head and his great jaws came together with a snap resistance to the authority of the national government no resistance to the travesty of government and the mockery of civilization under which we are being throttled the bayonet is now in the hands of a brutal negro militia the tyranny of military martinets was child's play to this as i answered your call this morning i was stopped and turned back in the street by the drill of a company of negroes under the command of a vicious scoundrel named gus who was my former slave he is the captain of this company eighty thousand armed negro troops answerable to no authority save the savage instincts of their officers terrorize the state every white company has been disarmed and disbanded by our scallywag governor i tell you sir we are walking on the crust of a volcano old stoneman scowled as the doctor rose and walked nervously to the window and back an appeal from you to the conscience of the north might save us he went on eagerly black hordes of former slaves with the intelligence of children and the instincts of savages armed with modern rifles parade daily in front of their unarmed former masters a white man has no right a negro need respect the children of the breed of men who speak the tongue of burns and shakespeare drake and raleigh have been disarmed and made subject to the black spawn of an african jungle can human flesh endure it when goth and vandal barbarians overran rome the negro was the slave of the roman empire the savages of the north blew out the light of ancient civilization but in all the dark ages which followed they never dreamed the leprous infamy of raising a black slave to rule over his former master no people in the history of the world have ever before been so basely betrayed so wantonly humiliated and degraded 
stoneman lifted his head in amazement at the burst of passionate intensity with which this southerner poured out his protest for a russian to rule a pole he went on a turk to rule a greek or an austrian to dominate an italian is hard enough but for a thick-lipped fat-nosed spindle-shanked negro exuding his nauseating animal odor to shout in derision over the hearths and homes of white men and women is an atrocity too monstrous for belief our people are yet dazed by its horror my god when they realize its meaning whose arm will be strong enough to hold them i should think the south was sufficiently armed with resistance to authority interrupted stoneman even so yet there is a moral force at the bottom of every living race of men the sense of right the feeling of racial destiny these are unconquered and unconquerable forces every man in south carolina today is glad that slavery is dead the war was not too great a price for us to pay for the lifting of its curse and now to ask a southerner to be the slave of a slave and yet doctor said stoneman coolly manhood suffrage is one eternal thing fixed in the nature of democracy it is inevitable at the price of racial life never said the southerner with fiery emphasis this republic is great not by reason of the amount of dirt we possess the size of our census roll or our voting register we are great because of the genius of the race of pioneer white freedmen who settled this continent dared the might of kings and made a wilderness the home of freedom our future depends on the purity of this racial stock the grant of the ballot to these millions of semi-savages and the riot of debauchery which has followed are crimes against human progress yet may we not train him asked stoneman to a point yes and then sink to his level if you walk as his equal in physical contact with him his race is not an infant it is a degenerate older than yours in time at last we are face to face with the man whom slavery concealed with its rags suffrage is but the new paper cloak with which the demagogue has sought to hide the issue can we assimilate the negro the very question is pollution in haiti no white man can own land black dukes and marquises drive over them and swear at them for getting under their wheels is civilization a patent cloak with which law tingers can wrap an animal and make him a king but the negro must be protected by the ballot protested the statesman the humblest man must have the opportunity to rise the real issue is democracy the issue sir is civilization not whether a negro shall be protected but whether society is worth saving from barbarism the statesman can educate put in the commoner the doctor cleared his throat with a quick little nervous cough he was in the habit of giving when deeply moved education sir is the development of that which is since the dawn of history the negro has owned the continent of africa rich beyond the dream of poet's fancy crunching acres of diamonds beneath his bare black feet yet he never picked one up from the dust until a white man showed to him its glittering light his land swarmed with powerful and docile animals yet he never dreamed a harness cart or sled a hunter by necessity he never made an axe spear or arrowhead worth preserving beyond the moment of its use he lived as an ox content to graze for an hour in a land of stone and timber he never sought a foot of lumber carved a block or built a house save of broken sticks and mud with league on league of ocean strand and miles of inland seas for four thousand years he watched their surface ripple under the wind heard the thunder of the surf on his beach the howl of the storm over his head gazed on the dim blue horizon calling him to worlds that lie beyond and yet he never dreamed a sail he lived as his fathers lived stole his food worked his wife sold his children ate his brother content to drink sing dance and sport as the ape and this creature half child half animal the sport of impulse whim and conceit pleased with a rattle tickled with a straw a being who left to his will roams at night and sleeps in the day whose speech knows no word of love whose passions once roused are as the fury of the tiger they have set this thing to rule over the southern people 
the doctor sprang to his feet his face livid his eyes blazing with emotion merciful god it surpasses human belief he sank exhausted in his chair and extending his hand in an eloquent gesture continued surely surely sir the people of the north are not mad we can yet appeal to the conscience and the brain of our brethren of a common race stoneman was silent as if stunned deep down in his strange soul he was drunk with the joy of a triumphant vengeance he had carried locked in the depths of his being yet the intensity of this man's suffering for a people's cause surprised and distressed him as all individual pain hurt him dr cameron rose stung by his silence and the consciousness of the hostility with which stoneman had wrapped himself pardon my apparent rudeness doctor he said at length extending his hand the violence of your feeling stunned me for a moment i'm obliged to you for speaking i like a plain-spoken man i am sorry to learn of the stupidity of the military commandant in this town my personal wrongs sir the doctor broke in are nothing i am sorry too about these individual cases of suffering they are the necessary incidents of a great upheaval but may it not all come out right in the end after the dark ages day broke at last we have the printing press railroad and telegraph a revolution in human affairs we may do in years what it took ages to do in the past may not the black man speedily emerge who knows an appeal to the north will be a waste of breath this experiment is going to be made it is written in the book of fate but i like you come to see me again dr cameron left with a heavy heart he had grown a great hope in this long wished for appeal to stoneman it had come to his ears that the old man who had dwelt as one dead in their village was a power it was ten o'clock before the doctor walked slowly back to the hotel he had passed the armory of the black militia they were still drilling under the command of gusts the windows were open through which came the steady tramp of heavy feet and the cry of hep 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 from the captain's thick cracked lips the full dress officer's uniform with its gold epaulets yellow stripes and glistening sword only accentuated the coarse bestiality of gusts his huge jaws seemed to hide completely the gold braid on his collar the doctor watched with a shudder his black bloated face covered with perspiration and the huge hand gripping his sword they suddenly halted in double ranks and gus yelled order arms the butts of their rifles crashed to the floor with precision and they were allowed to break ranks for a brief rest they sang john brown's body and as its echoes died away a big negro swung his rifle in a circle over his head shouting here's your regulator for white trash and days nine hundred of em in this county yes lord howled another we got em down now and we keep em down there child bawled another the doctor passed on slowly to the hotel the night was dark the streets were without lights under their present rulers and the stars were hidden with swift flying clouds which threatened a storm as he passed under the boughs of an oak in the front of his house a voice above him whispered a message for you sir had the wings of a spirit suddenly brushed his cheek he would not have been more startled who are you he asked with a slight tremor a night hawk of the invisible empire with a message from the grand dragon of the realm was the low answer as he thrust a note in the doctor's hand i will wait for your answer the doctor fumbled to his office on the corner of the lawn struck a match and read a great scotch-irish leader of the south from memphis is here tonight and wishes to see you if you will meet general forrest i will bring him to the hotel in fifteen minutes burn this then the doctor walked quickly back to the spot where he had heard the voice and said i'll see him with pleasure the invisible messenger wheeled his horse and in a moment the echo of his muffled hoofs had died away in the distance end of book three chapter ten Book Three, Chapter Eleven of *The Clansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Eleven: The Beat of a Sparrow's Wing. 
dr cameron's appeal had left the old commoner unshaken in his idea there could be but one side to any question with such a man and that was his side he would stand by his own men too he believed in his own forces the bayonet was essential to his revolutionary program hence the hand which held it could do no wrong wrongs were accidents which might occur under any system yet in no way did he display the strange contradictions of his character so plainly as in his inability to hate the individual who stood for the idea he was fighting with maniac fury he liked dr cameron instantly though he had come to do a crime that would send him into beggared exile individual suffering he could not endure in this the doctor's appeal had startling results he sent for mrs lenoir and marion i understand madam he said gravely that your house and farm are to be sold for taxes yes sir we've given it up this time nothing can be done was the hopeless answer would you consider an offer of twenty dollars an acre nobody would be fool enough to offer it you can buy all the land in the county for a dollar an acre it's not worth anything i disagree with you said stoneman cheerfully i am looking far ahead i would like to make an experiment here with pennsylvania methods on this land i'll give you ten thousand dollars cash for your five hundred acres if you will take it you don't mean it mrs lenoir gasped choking back the tears certainly you can at once return to your home i'll take another house and invest your money for you in good northern securities the mother burst into sobs unable to speak while marion threw her arms impulsively around the old man's neck and kissed him his cold eyes were warmed with the first tear they had shed in years he moved the next day to the ross estate which he rented had sam brought back to the home of his childhood in charge of a good-natured white attendant and installed in one of the little cottages on the lawn he ordered lynch to arrest the keeper of the poor and hold him on a charge of assault with intent to kill awaiting the action of the grand jury the lieutenant governor received this order with sullen anger yet he saw to its execution he was not quite ready for a break with the man who had made him astonished at his new humor phil and elsie hastened to confess to him their love affairs and ask his approval of their choice his reply was cautious yet he did not refuse his consent he advised them to wait a few months allow him time to know the young people and get his bearings on the conditions of southern society his mood of tenderness was a startling revelation to them of the depth and intensity of his love when mrs lenoir returned with marion to her vine-clad home she spent the first day of perfect joy since the death of her lover husband the deed had not yet been made of the transfer of the farm but it was only a question of legal formality she was to receive the money in the form of interest-bearing securities and deliver the title on the following morning arm in arm mother and daughter visited again each hallowed spot with the sweet sense of ownership the place was in perfect order its flowers were in gorgeous bloom its walks clean and neat the fences painted and the gates swung on new hinges they stood with their arms about one another watching the sun sink behind the mountains with tears of gratitude and hope stirring their souls ben cameron strode through the gate and they hurried to meet him with cries of joy just dropped in a minute to see if you're snug for the night he said of course snug and so happy we've been hugging one another for hours said the mother oh ben the clouds have lifted at last has aunt sandy come yet he asked no but she'll be here in the morning to get breakfast we don't want anything to eat she answered then i'll come out when i'm through my business tonight and sleep in the house to keep you company nonsense said the mother we couldn't think of putting you to the trouble we've spent many a night here alone but not in the past two years he said with a frown we're not afraid marion said with a smile besides we keep you awake all night with our laughter and foolishness rummaging through the house you'd better let me ben protested no said the mother 
we'll be happier tonight alone with only god's eye to see how perfectly silly we can be come and take supper with us tomorrow night bring elsie and her guitar i don't like the banjo and we'll have a little love feast with music in the moonlight yes do that cried marion i know we owe this good luck to her i want to tell her how much i love her for it well if you insist on staying alone said ben reluctantly i'll bring miss elsie tomorrow but i don't like you being here without aunt cindy tonight oh we're all right laughed marion but what i want to know is what you're doing out so late every night since you've come home and where you were gone for the past week important business he answered soberly business i expect she cried look here ben cameron have you another girl somewhere you're flirting with yes he answered slowly coming closer and his voice dropping to a whisper and her name is death why ben marion gasped placing her trembling hand unconsciously on his arm a faint flush mantling her cheek and leaving it white what do you mean asked the mother in low tones nothing i can explain i only wish to warn you both never to ask me such questions before anyone forgive me said marion with a tremor i didn't think it serious ben pressed the little warm hand watching her mouth quiver with a smile that was half a sigh as he answered you know i'd trust either of you with my life but i can't be too careful well remember sir knight said the mother don't forget then tomorrow and spend the evening with us i wish i had one of marion's new dresses done poor child she has never had a decent dress in her life before you know i never look at my pretty baby grown to such a beautiful womanhood without hearing henry say over and over again beauty is a sign of the soul the body is the soul well i've my doubts about your improving her with a fine dress he replied thoughtfully i don't believe that more beautifully dressed women ever walk the earth than our girls of the south who came out of the war clad in the pathos of poverty smiling bravely through the shadows bearing themselves as queens though they wore the dress of the shepherdess i'm almost tempted to kiss you for that as you once took advantage of me said marion with enthusiasm the moon had risen and a whippoorwill was chanting his weird song on the lawn as ben left them leaning on the gate it was past midnight before they finished the last touches in restoring their nest to its old home-like appearance and sat down happy and tired in the room in which marion was born brooding and dreaming and talking over the future their mother was hanging on the words of her daughter all the baffled love of the dead poet husband her griefs and poverty consumed in the glowing joy of new hopes her love for this child was now a triumphant passion which had melted her own being into the object of worship until the soul of the daughter was superimposed on the mother's as the magnetized by the magnetizer and you'll never keep a secret from me dear she asked marion never you'll tell me all your love affairs she asked softly as she drew the shining blonde head down on her shoulder faithfully you know i've been afraid sometimes you were keeping something back from me deep down in your heart and i'm jealous you didn't refuse henry greer because you loved ben cameron now did you the little head lay still before she answered how many times must i tell you silly that i've loved ben since i can remember that i will always love him and when i meet my fate at last i shall boast to my children of my sweet girl romance with the hero of piedmont and they shall laugh and cry with me over what's that whispered the mother leaping to her feet i heard nothing marion answered listening i thought i heard footsteps on the porch maybe it's ben who decided to come anyhow said the girl but he'd knock whispered the mother the door flew open with a crash and four black brutes leaped into the room gus in the lead with a revolver in his hand his yellow teeth grinning through his thick lips scream now and i'll blow your brains out he growled blanched with horror the mother sprang before marion with a shivering cry what do you want not you said gus closing the blinds and handing a rope to another brute tie to old one to the bedpost 
the mother screamed a blow from the black fist in her mouth and the rope was tied with the strength of despair she tore at the cords half rising to her feet while with mortal anguish she gasped for god's sake spare my baby do as you will with me and kill me do not touch her again the huge fist swept her to the floor marion staggered against the wall her face white her delicate lips trembling with the chill of a fear colder than death we have no money the deed has not been delivered she pleaded a sudden glimmer of hope flashing in her blue eyes gus stepped closer with an ugly leer his flat nose dilated his sinister bead eyes wide apart gleaming ape-like and he laughed we ain't after money the girl uttered a cry long tremulous heart-rending piteous a single tiger sprang and the black claws of the beast sank into the soft white throat and she was still end of book three chapter eleven Book Three, Chapter Twelve of *The Clansmen*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan, by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Twelve, At the Dawn of Day. It was three o'clock before Marion regained consciousness, crawled to her mother, and crouched in dumb convulsions in her arms. "'What can we do, my darling?' the mother asked at last. "'Die? Thank God we have the strength left.' "'Yes, my love,' was the faint answer. "'No one must ever know.' we will hide quickly every trace of crime they will think we strolled to lovers leave and fell over the cliff and my name will always be sweet and clean you understand come we must hurry with swift hands her blue eyes shining with strange light the girl removed the shreds of torn clothes bathed and put on the dress of spotless white she wore the night ben cameron kissed her and called her a heroine the mother cleaned and swept the room piled the torn clothes and cord in the fireplace and burned them dressed herself as if for a walk softly closed the doors and hurried with her daughter along the old pathway through the moonlit woods at the edge of the forest she stopped and looked back tenderly at the little home shining amid the roses caught their faint perfume and faltered let's go back a minute i want to see his room and kiss henry's picture again no we are going to him now i hear him calling us in the mists above the cliff said the girl come we must hurry we might go mad and fail down the dim cathedral aisles of the woods hallowed by tender memories through which the poet lover and father had taught them to walk with reverend feet and without fear they fled to the old meeting place of love on the brink of the precipice the mother trembled paused drew back and gasped are you not afraid my dear no death is sweet now said the girl i fear only pity of those we love is there no other way we might go among strangers pleaded the mother we could not escape ourselves the thought of life is torture only those who hate me could wish that i live the grave will be soft and cool the light of day a burning shame come back to the seat a moment let me tell you my love again urged the mother life still is dear while i hold your hand as they sat in brooding anguish floating up from the river valley came the music of a banjo in a negro cabin mingled with vulgar shout and song and dance a verse of the ribald senseless lay of the player echoed above the banjo's pert refrain chicken in the bread tray picking up dough granny will your dog bite no child no the mother shivered and drew marion closer oh dear oh dear has it come to this all my hopes of your beautiful life the girl lifted her head and kissed the quivering lips with what loving wonder we saw you grow she sighed 
from a tottering babe on to the hour we watched the mystic light of maidenhood dawn in your blue eyes and all to end in this hideous leprous shame no no i will not have it it's only a horrible dream god is not dead the young mother sank to her knees and buried her face in marion's lap in a hopeless paroxysm of grief the girl bent kissed the curling hair and smoothed it with her soft hand a sparrow chirped in the tree above a wren twittered in a bush and down on the river's bank a mockingbird softly waked his mate with a note of thrilling sweetness the morning is coming dearest we must go said marion this shame i can never forget nor will the world forget death is the only way they walked to the brink and the mother's arms stole around the girl oh my baby my beautiful darling life of my life heart of my heart soul of my soul they stood for a moment as if listening to the music of the falls looking out over the valley faintly outlining itself in the dawn the first faraway streaks of blue light on the mountain ranges defining distance slowly appeared a fresh motionless day brooded over the world as the amorous stir of the spirit of morning rose from the moist earth of the fields below a bright star still shone in the sky and the face of the mother gazed on it intently did the woman spirit the burning focus of the fiercest desire to live and will catch in this supreme moment the star's divine speech before which all human passions sink into silence perhaps for she smiled the daughter answered with a smile and then hand in hand they stepped from the cliff into the mists and on through the opal gates of death end of book three chapter twelve end of book three Book Four, Chapter One of *The Clansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Book Four, *The Ku Klux Klan*, Chapter One: The Hunt for the Animal. Aunt Cindy came at seven o'clock to get breakfast, and finding the house closed and no one at home, supposed Mrs. Lenoir and Marion had remained at the Cameron house for the night. She sat down on the steps, waited grumblingly an hour, and then hurried to the hotel to scold her former mistress for keeping her out so long. Accustomed to enter familiarly, she thrust her head into the dining room, where the family were at breakfast with a solitary guest, muttering the speech she had been rehearsing on the way. I like to know what sort of way dis. Where's Miss Jeanie? Ben leaped to his feet. Isn't she at home? Been waiting there two hours. Great God, he groaned, springing through the door and rushing to saddle the mare as he left he called to his father let no one know till i return at the house he could find no trace of the crime he had suspected every room was in perfect order he searched the yard carefully and under the cedar by the window he saw the barefoot tracks of a negro the white man was never born who could make that track the enormous heel projected backward, and in the hollow of the instep where the dirt could scarcely be touched by an Aryan was the deep, wide mark of the African's flat foot. He carefully measured it, brought from an outhouse a box, and fastened it over the spot. It might have been an ordinary chicken thief, of course. He could not tell, but it was a fact of big import. A sudden hope flashed through his mind that they might have risen with the sun and strolled to their favorite haunt at Lover's Leap. In two minutes he was there, gazing with hard-set eyes at Marion's hat and handkerchief lying on the shelving rock. The mare bent her glistening neck, touched the hat with her nose, lifted her head, dilated her delicate nostrils, looked out over the cliff with her great soft half-human eyes, and whinnied gently. Ben leaped to the ground, picked up the handkerchief, and looked at the initials. 
m l worked in the corner he knew what lay on the river's brink below as well as if he stood over the dead bodies he kissed the letters of her name crushed the handkerchief in his locked hands and cried now lord god give me the strength for the service of my people he hurriedly examined the ground amazed to find no trace of a struggle or crime could it be possible that they had ventured too near the brink and fallen over he hurried to report to his father his discoveries instructed his mother and margaret to keep the servants quiet until the truth was known and the two men returned along the river's brink to the foot of the cliff they found the bodies close to the water's edge marion had been killed instantly her fair blonde head lay in a crimson circle sharply defined in the white sand but the mother was still warm with life she had scarcely ceased to breathe in one last desperate throb of love the trembling soul had dragged the dying body to the girl's side and she had died with her head resting on the fair round neck as though she had kissed her and fallen asleep father and son clasped hands and stood for a moment with the uncovered heads the doctor said at length go to the coroner at once and see that he summons the jury you select and hand to him bring them immediately i will examine the bodies before they arrive ben took the negro coroner into his office alone turned the key told him of the discovery and handed him the list of the jury i'll had her see mr lynch first sir he answered ben placed his hand on his hip pocket and said coldly put your cross marks on those forms i've made out there for you go with me immediately and summon these men if you dare put a negro on this jury or open your mouth as to what has occurred in this room i'll kill you the negro tremblingly did as he was commanded the coroner's jury reported that the mother and daughter had been killed by accidentally falling over the cliff in all the throng of grief-stricken friends who came to the little cottage that day but two men knew the hell-lit secret beneath the tragedy when the bodies reached the home dr cameron placed mrs cameron and margaret outside to receive visitors and prevent anyone from disturbing him he took ben into the room and locked the doors my boy i wish you to witness an experiment he drew from its case a powerful microscope of french make what on earth are you going to do sir the doctor's brilliant eyes flashed with a mystic light as he replied find the fiend who did this crime and then we will hang him on a gallows so high that all men from the rivers to ends of the earth shall see and feel and will know the might of an unconquerable race of men but there's no trace of him here we shall see said the doctor adjusting his instrument i believe that a microscope of sufficient power will reveal on the retina of these dead eyes the image of this devil as if etched there by fire the experiment has been made successfully in france no word or deed of man is lost a german scholar has a memory so wonderful he can repeat whole volumes of latin german and french without an error a russian officer has been known to repeat the roll call of any regiment by reading it twice psychologists hold that nothing is lost from the memory of man impressions remain in the brain like words written on paper in invisible ink so i believe of images in the eye if we can trace them early enough if no impression were made subsequently on the mother's eye by the light of day i believe the fire-etched record of this crime can yet be traced ben watched him with breathless interest he first examined marion's eyes but in the cold azure blue of their pure depths he could find nothing it's as i feared with the child he said i can see nothing it's on the mother i rely in the splendor of life at thirty-seven she was the full-blown perfection of womanhood with every vital force at its highest tension he looked long and patiently into the dead mother's eye rose and wiped the perspiration from his face what is it sir asked ben without reply as if in a trance he returned to the microscope and again rose with the little quick nervous cough he gave only in the greatest excitement and whispered look now and tell me what you see ben looked and said i can see nothing 
your powers of vision are not trained as mine replied the doctor resuming his place at the instrument what do you see asked the younger man bending nervously the bestial figure of a negro his huge black hand plainly defined the upper part of the face is dim as if obscured by a gray mist of dawn but the massive jaws and lips are clear merciful god yes it's gus the doctor leaped to his feet livid with excitement ben bent again looked long and eagerly but could see nothing i'm afraid the image is in your eye sir not the mother's said ben sadly that's possible of course said the doctor yet i don't believe it i've thought of the same scoundrel and tried bloodhounds on the track but for some reason they couldn't follow it i suspected him from the first and especially since learning that he left for columbia on the early morning train on pretended official business then i'm not mistaken insisted the doctor trembling with excitement now do as i tell you find when he returns capture him bind gag and carry him to your meeting place under the cliff and let me know on the afternoon of the funeral two days later ben received a cipher telegram from the conductor on the train telling him that gus was on the evening mail due at piedmont at nine o'clock the papers had been filled with accounts of the accident and an enormous crowd from the county and many admirers of the fiery lyrics of the poet father had come from distant parts to honor his name all business was suspended and the entire white population of the village followed the bodies to their last resting place as the crowds returned to their homes no notice was taken of a dozen men on horseback who rode out of town by different ways about dusk at eight o'clock they met in the woods near the first little flag station located on McAllister's farm four miles from piedmont where a buggy awaited them two men of powerful build who were strangers in the county alighted from the buggy and walked along the track to board the train at the station three miles beyond and confer with the conductor the men who gathered in the woods dismounted removed their saddles and from the folds of the blankets took a white disguise for horse and man in a moment it was fitted on each horse with buckles at the throat breast and tail and the saddles were placed the white robe for the man was made in the form of an ulster overcoat with a cape the skirt extending to the top of the shoes from the red belt at the waist were swung two revolvers which had been concealed in their pockets on each man's breast was a scarlet circle within which shone a white cross the same scarlet circle and cross appeared on the horse's breast while on his flanks flamed the three red mystic letters k k k each man wore a white cap from the edges of which fell a piece of cloth extending to the shoulders beneath the visor was an opening for the eyes and lower down one for the mouth on the front of the caps of two of the men appeared the red wings of a hawk as the ensign of rank from the top of each cap rose eighteen inches high a single spike held erect by a twisted wire the disguises for man and horse were made of cheap unbleached domestic and weighed less than three pounds they were easily folded within a blanket and kept under the saddle in a crowd without discovery it required less than two minutes to remove the saddles place the disguises and remount at the signal of a whistle the men and horses arrayed in white and scarlet swung into double file cavalry formation and stood awaiting orders the moon was now shining brightly and its light shimmering on the silent horses and men with their tall spiked caps made a picture such as the world had not seen since the knights of the middle ages rode on their holy crusades as the train neared the flag station which was dark and unattended the conductor approached gus leaned over and said i've just gotten a message from the sheriff telling me to warn you to get off at this station and slip into town there's a crowd at the depot there waiting for you and they mean trouble gus trembled and whispered then for god's sake let me off in here the two men who got on at the station below stepped out before the negro and as he alighted from the car seized tripped and threw him to the ground the engineer blew a sharp signal and the train pulled on in a minute gus was bound and gagged one of the men drew a whistle and blew twice a single tremulous call like the cry of an owl answered 
the swift beat of horses' feet followed and four white and scarlet clansmen swept in a circle around the group one of the strangers turned to the horseman with red-winged ensign on his cap saluted and said here's your man nighthawk thanks gentlemen was the answer let us know when we can be of service to your county the strangers sprang into their buggy and disappeared toward the north carolina line the clansmen blindfolded the negro placed him on a horse tied his legs securely and his arms behind him to the ring in the saddle the night hawk blew his whistle four sharp blasts and his pickets galloped from their positions and joined him again the signal rang and his men wheeled with the precision of trained cavalrymen into column formation three abreast and rode toward piedmont the single black figure tied and gagged in the center of the white and scarlet squadron end of book four chapter one Book Four, Chapter Two of *The Clansmen*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Two, The Fiery Cross. The clansmen, with their prisoners, skirted the village and halted in the woods on the river bank. The night hawk signaled for single file, and in a few minutes they stood against the cliff under Lover's Leap and saluted their chief, who sat on his horse, awaiting their arrival. Pickets were placed in each direction on the narrow path by which the spot was approached, and one was sent to stand guard on the shelving rock above. Through the narrow, crooked entrance they led Gus into the cave which had been the rendezvous of the Piedmont den of the clan since its formation. The meeting place was a grand hall, eighty feet deep, fifty feet wide, and more than forty feet in height, which had been carved out of the stone by the swift current of the river in ages past when its waters stood at a higher level tonight it was lighted by candles placed on the ledges of the walls in the centre on a fallen boulder sat the grand cyclops of the den the presiding officer of the township his rank marked by scarlet stripes on the white cloth spike of his cap around him stood twenty or more clansmen in their uniforms completely disguised one among them wore a yellow sash trimmed in gold about his waist and on his breast two yellow circles with red crosses interlapping denoting his rank to be the grand dragon of the realm or commander-in-chief of the state the cyclops rose from his seat let the grand turk remove his prisoner for a moment and place him in charge of the grand sentinel at the door until summoned the officer disappeared with Gus, and the Cyclops continued. The chaplain will open our council with prayer. Solemnly, every white shrouded figure knelt on the ground, and the voice of the Reverend Hugh McAlpin, trembling with feeling, echoed through the cave. Lord God of our fathers, as in times past thy children, fleeing from the oppressor, found refuge beneath the earth until once more the sun of righteousness rose so are we met to-night as we wrestle with the powers of darkness now strangling our life give to our souls to endure as seeing the invisible and to our right arms the strength of the martyred dead of our people have mercy on the poor the weak the innocent and defenseless and deliver us from the body of the black death in a land of light and beauty and love our women are prisoners of danger and fear while the heathen walks his native heath unharmed and unafraid in this fair christian southland our sisters wives and daughters dare not stroll at twilight through the streets or step beyond the highway at noon the terror of the twilight deepens with the darkness, and the stoutest heart grows sick with fear for the red message the morning bringeth. Forgive our sins, they are many, but hide not thy face from us, O God, for thou art our refuge. As the last echoes of the prayer lingered and died in the vaulted roof, the clansmen rose and stood a moment in silence. Again the voice of the cyclops broke the stillness brethren we are met tonight at the request of the grand dragon of the realm 
who has honored us with his presence to constitute a high court for the trial of a case involving life are the night hawks ready to submit their evidence we are ready came the answer then let the grand scribe read the objects of the order on which your authority rests the scribe opened his book of record the prescript of the order of the invisible empire and solemnly read to the lovers of law and order peace and justice and to the shades of the venerated dead greeting this is an institution of chivalry humanity mercy and patriotism embodying in its genius and principles all that is chivalric in conduct noble in sentiment generous in manhood and patriotic in purpose its particular objects being first to protect the weak the innocent and the defenseless from the indignities wrongs and outrages of the lawless the violent and the brutal to relieve the injured and the oppressed to succor the suffering and unfortunate and especially the widows and the orphans of confederate soldiers second to protect and defend the constitution of the united states and all the laws passed in conformity thereto and to protect the states and the people thereof from all invasion from any source whatever third to aid and assist in the execution of all constitutional laws and to protect the people from unlawful seizure and from trial except by their peers in conformity to the laws of the land the night hawks will produce their evidence said the cyclops and the grand monk will conduct the case of the people against the negro augustus caesar the former slave of dr richard cameron dr cameron advanced and removed his cap his snow-white hair and beard ruddy face and dark brown brilliant eyes made a strange picture in its weird surroundings like an ancient alchemist ready to conduct some daring experiment in the problem of life i am here brethren he said to accuse the black brute about to appear of the crime of assault on a daughter of the south a murmur of thrilling surprise and horror swept the crowd of white and scarlet figures as with one common impulse they moved closer his feet have been measured and they exactly tally with the negro tracks found under the window of the lenoir cottage his flight to columbia and return on the publication of their deaths as an accident is a confirmation of our case i will not relate to you the scientific experiment which first fixed my suspicion of this man's guilt my witness could not confirm it and it might not be to you credible but this negro is peculiarly sensitive to hypnotic influence i propose to put him under this power to-night before you and if he is guilty i can make him tell his confederates describe and rehearse the crime itself the night hawks led gus before dr cameron untied his hands removed the gag and slipped the blindfold from his head under the doctor's rigid gaze the negro's knees struck together and he collapsed into complete hypnosis merely lifting his huge paws lamely as if to ward off a blow they seated him on the boulder from which the cyclops rose and gus stared about the cave and grinned as if in a dream seeing nothing the doctor recalled to him the day of the crime and he began to talk to his three confederates describing his plot in detail now and then pausing and breaking into a fiendish laugh old mcallister who had three lovely daughters at home threw off his cap sank to his knees and buried his face in his hands while a dozen of the white figures crowded closer nervously gripping the revolvers which hung from their red belts dr cameron pushed them back and lifted his hand in warning the negro began to live the crime with fearful realism the journey past the hotel to make sure the victims had gone to their home the visit to aunt cindy's cabin to find her there lying in the field waiting for the last light of the village to go out gloating with vulgar exultation over their plot and planning other crimes to follow its success how they crept along the shadows of the hedgerow of the lawn to avoid the moonlight stood under the cedar and through the open windows watched the mother and daughter laughing and talking within mind what i tells you now tied to old one when i give you the rope said gus in a whisper my god cried the agonized voice of the figure with the double cross that's what the piece of burnt rope in the fireplace meant dr cameron again lifted his hand for silence now they burst into the room and with the light of hell in his beady yellow splotched eyes gus gripped his imaginary revolver and growled 
scream and i'll blow your brains out in spite of dr cameron's warning the white-robed figures jostled and pressed closer gus rose to his feet and started across the cave as if to spring on the shivering figure of the girl the clansman with muttered groans sobs and curses falling back as he advanced he still wore his full captain's uniform its heavy epaulets flashing their gold in the unearthly light his beastly jaws half covering the gold braid on the collar his thick lips were drawn upward in an ugly leer and his sinister beak eyes gleamed like a gorilla's a single fierce leap and the black claws clutched the air slowly as if sinking into the soft white throat strong men began to cry like children stop him stop him screamed a clansman springing on the negro and grinding his heel into his big thick neck a dozen more were on him in a moment kicking stamping cursing and crying like madmen dr cameron leaped forward and beat them off man man you must not kill him in this condition some of the white figures had fallen prostrate on the ground sobbing in a frenzy of uncontrollable emotion some were leaning against the walls their faces buried in their arms again old mcallister was on his knees crying over and over again god have mercy on my people when at length quiet was restored the negro was revived and again bound blindfolded gagged and thrown to the ground before the grand cyclops a sudden inspiration flashed in dr cameron's eyes turning to the figure with yellow sash and double cross he said issue your orders and dispatch your courier tonight with the old scottish rite of the fiery cross it will send a thrill of inspiration to every clansman in the hills good prepare it quickly was the answer dr cameron opened his medicine case drew the silver drinking cover from a flask and passed out of the cave to the dark circle of blood still shining in the sand by the water's edge he knelt and filled the cup half full of the crimson grains and dipped it into the river from a saddle he took the light wood torch returned within and placed the cup on the boulder on which the grand cyclops had sat he loosed the bundle of light wood took two pieces tied them into the form of a cross and laid it beside a lighted candle near the silver cup the silent figures watched his every movement he lifted the cup and said brethren i hold in my hand the water of your river bearing the red stain of the life of a southern woman a priceless sacrifice on the altar of outraged civilization hear the message of your chief the tall figure with the yellow sash and double cross stepped before the strange altar while the white forms of the clansmen gathered about him in a circle he lifted his cap and laid it on the boulder and his men gazed on the flushed face of ben cameron the grand dragon of the realm he stood for a moment silent erect a smouldering fierceness in his eyes something cruel and yet magnetic in his alert bearing he looked on the prostrate negro lying in his uniform at his feet seized the cross lighted the three upper ends and held it blazing in his hand while in a voice full of the fires of feeling he said men of the south the time for words has passed the hour for action has struck the grand turk will execute this negro tonight and fling his body on the lawn of the black lieutenant governor of the state the grand turk bowed i ask for the swiftest messenger of this den who can ride till dawn the man whom dr cameron had already chosen stepped forward carry my summons to the grand titan of the adjoining province in north carolina whom you will find at hambright tell him the story of this crime and what you have seen and heard ask him to report to me here the second night from this at eleven o'clock with six grand giants from his adjoining counties each accompanied by two hundred picked men in olden times when the chieftain of our people summoned the clan on an errand of life and death the fiery cross extinguished in sacrificial blood was sent by swift courier from village to village this call was never made in vain nor will it be to-night in the new world here on this spot made holy ground by the blood of those we hold dearer than life i raise the ancient symbol of an unconquered race of men high above his head in the darkness of the cave he lifted the blazing emblem the fiery cross of old scotland's hills 
i quench its flames in the sweetest blood that ever stained the sands of time he dipped its ends in the silver cup extinguished the fire and handed the charred symbol to the courier who quickly disappeared end of book four chapter two Book Four, Chapter Three of *The Clansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Three. The Parting of the Ways. The discovery of the captain of the African Guards lying in his full uniform in Lynch's yard sent a thrill of terror to the triumphant leagues across the breast of the body was pinned a scrap of paper on which was written in red ink the letters k k k it was the first actual evidence of the existence of this dreaded order in ulster county the first lieutenant of the guards assumed command and held the full company in their armory under arms day and night beneath his door he had found a notice which was also nailed on the courthouse it appeared in the piedmont eagle and in rapid succession in every newspaper not under negro influence in the state it read as follows headquarters of realm number no. four dreadful era black epoch hideous hour general order number no. one the negro militia now organized in this state threatens the extinction of civilization they have avowed their purpose to make war upon and exterminate the ku klux klan an organization which is now the sole guardian of society all negroes are hereby given forty-eight hours from the publication of this notice in their respective counties to surrender their arms at the courthouse door those who refuse must take the consequences by order of the gd of the realm number no. four by the grand scribe the white people of piedmont read this notice with a thrill of exultant joy men walked the streets with an erect bearing which said without words stand out of the way for the first time since the dawn of black rule negroes began to yield to white men and women the right of way on the streets on the day following the old commoner sent for phil what is the latest news he asked the town is in a fever of excitement not over the discovery in lynch's yard but over the blacker rumor that marion and her mother committed suicide to conceal an assault by this fiend a trumped-up lie said the old man emphatically it's true sir i'll take dr cameron's word for it you have just come from the camerons yes let it be your last visit the camerons are on the road to the gallows father and son lynch informs me that the murder committed last night and the insolent notice nailed on the courthouse door could have come only from their brain they are the hereditary leaders of these people they alone would have the audacity to fling this crime into the teeth of the world and threaten worse we are face to face with southern barbarism every man now to his own standard the house of stoneman can have no part with midnight assassins nor with black barbarians father it is a question of who possesses the right of life and death over the citizen the organized virtue of the community or its organized crime you have mistaken for death the patience of a generous people we call ourselves the champions of liberty yet for less than they have suffered kings have lost their heads and empires perished before the wrath of freemen my boy this is not a question for argument between us said the father with stern emphasis this conspiracy of terror and assassination threatens to shatter my work to atoms the election on which turns the destiny of congress and the success or failure of my life is but a few weeks away unless this foul conspiracy is crushed i am ruined and the nation falls again beneath the heel of the slaveholders oligarchy your nightmare of the slaveholders oligarchy does not disturb me at least you will have the decency to break your affair with margaret cameron pending the issue of my struggle of life and death with her father and brother never then i will do it for you i warn you sir phil cried with anger that if it comes to an issue of race against race i am a white man the ghastly tragedy of the condition of society here is something for which the people of the south are no longer responsible i'll take the responsibility growled the old cynic don't ask me to share it said the younger man emphatically 
the father winced his lips trembled and he answered brokenly my boy this is the bitterest hour of my life that has had little to make it sweet to hear such words from you is more than i can bear i am an old man now my sands are nearly run but two human beings love me and i love but two on you and your sister i have lavished all the treasures of a maimed and strangled soul and it has come to this read the notice which one of your friends thrust into the window of my bedroom last night he handed phil a piece of paper on which was written the old club-footed beast who has sneaked into our town pretending to search for health in reality the leader of the infernal union league will be given forty-eight hours to vacate the house and rid this community of his presence k k k are you an officer of the union league phil asked in surprise i am its soul how could a southerner discover this if your own children didn't know it by their spies who have joined the league and do the rank and file know the black pope at the head of the order no but high officials do does lynch certainly then he is the scoundrel who placed that note in your room it is a clumsy attempt to forge an order of the clan the white man does not live in this town capable of that act i know these people my boy you are bewitched by the smiles of a woman to deny your own flesh and blood nonsense father you are possessed by an idea which has become an insane mania will you respect my wishes the old man broke in angrily i will not was the clear answer phil turned and left the room and the old man's massive head sank on his breast in helpless baffled rage and grief he was more successful in his appeal to elsie he convinced her of the genuineness of the threat against him the brutal reference to his lameness roused the girl's soul when the old man crushed by phil's desertion broke down the last reserve of his strange cold nature tore his wounded heart open to her cried in agony over his deformity his lameness and the anguish with which he saw the threatened ruin of his life work she threw her arms around his neck in a flood of tears and cried hush father i will not desert you i will never leave you or wed without your blessing if i find that my lover was in any way responsible for this insult i'll tear his image out of my heart and never speak his name again she wrote a note to ben asking him to meet her at sundown on horseback at lover's leap ben was elated at the unexpected request he was hungry for an hour with his sweetheart whom he had not seen save for a moment since the storm of excitement broke following the discovery of the crime he hastened through his work of ordering the movement of the clan for the night and determined to surprise elsie by meeting her in his uniform of a grand dragon secure in her loyalty he would deliberately thus put his life in her hands using the water of a brook in the woods for a mirror he adjusted his yellow sash and pushed the two revolvers back under the cape out of sight saying to himself with a laugh betray me well if she does life would not be worth living when elsie had recovered from the first shock of surprise at the white horse and rider waiting for her under the shadows of the old beach her surprise gave way to grief at the certainty of his guilt and the greatness of his love in thus placing his life without a question in her hands he tied the horses in the woods and they sat down on the rustic he removed his helmet cap threw back the white cape showing the scarlet lining and the two golden circles with their flaming crosses on his breast with boyish pride the costume was becoming to his slender graceful figure and he knew it you see sweetheart i hold high rank in the empire he whispered from beneath his cape he drew a long bundle which he unrolled it was a triangular flag of brilliant yellow edged in scarlet in the center of the yellow ground was the figure of a huge black dragon with fiery red eyes and tongue around it was a latin motto worked in scarlet quod semper quod ubique quod ab omnibus what always what everywhere what by all has been held to be true the battle flag of the clan he said the standard of the grand dragon elsie seized his hand and kissed it unable to speak why so serious tonight do you love me very much she answered greater love hath no man than this that he lay his life at the feet of his beloved he responded tenderly 
yes yes i know and that is why you are breaking my heart when first i met you it seemed now ages and ages ago i was a vain self-willed pert little thing it's not so i took you for an angel you were one you are one tonight now she went on slowly in what i have lived through you i have grown into an impassioned serious self-disciplined bewildered woman your perfect trust tonight is the sweetest revelation that can come to a woman's soul and yet it brings to me unspeakable pain for what you are guilty of murder ben's figure stiffened the judge who pronounces sentence of death on a criminal outlawed by civilized society is not usually called a murderer my dear and by whose authority are you a judge by authority of the sovereign people who created the state of south carolina the criminals who claim to be our officers are usurpers placed there by the subversion of law won't you give this all up for my sake she pleaded believe me you are in great danger not so great as the danger of my sister and mother and my sweetheart it is a man's place to face danger he gravely answered this violence can only lead to your ruin and shame i am fighting the battle of a race on whose fate hangs the future of the south and the nation my ruin and shame will be of small account if they are saved was the even answer come my dear she pleaded tenderly you know that i have weighed the treasures of music and art and have given them all for one clasp of your hand one throb of your heart against mine i should call you cruel did i not know you are infinitely tender this is the only thing i have ever asked you to do for me desert my people you must not ask of me this infamy if you love me he cried but listen this is wrong this wild vengeance is a crime you are doing however great the provocation we cannot continue to love one another if you do this listen i love you better than father mother life or career all my dreams i've lost in you i've lived through eternity today with my father you know me guiltless of the vulgar threat against him yes and yet you are the leader of desperate men who might have done it as i fought this battle today i've lost you lost myself and sunk down to the depths of despair and at the end rang one weak cry of a woman's heart for her lover your frown can darken the brightest sky for your sake i can give up all save the sense of right i'll walk by your side in life lead you gently and tenderly along the way of my dreams if i can but if you go your way it shall be mine and i shall still be glad because you are there see how humble i am only you must not commit crime come sweetheart you must not use that word he protested with a touch of wounded pride you are a conspirator i am a revolutionist you are committing murder i am waging war elsie leaped to her feet in a sudden rush of anger and extended her hand good-bye i shall not see you again i do not know you you are still a stranger to me he held her hand firmly we must not part in anger he said slowly i have grave work to do before the day dawns we may not see each other again she led her horse to the seat quickly and without waiting for his assistance sprang into the saddle do you not fear my betrayal of your secret she asked he rode to her side bent close and whispered it's as safe as if locked in the heart of god a little sob caught her voice yet she said slowly in firm tones if another crime is committed in this county by your clan we will never see each other again he escorted her to the edge of the town without a word pressed her hand in silence wheeled his horse and disappeared on the road to the north carolina line end of book four chapter three Book Four, Chapter Four of *The Clansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Four, The Banner of the Dragon. 
then cameron rode rapidly to the rendezvous of the pickets who were to meet the coming squadrons he returned home and ate a hearty meal as he emerged from the dining-room phil seized him by the arm and led him under the big oak on the lawn cameron old boy i'm in a lot of trouble i've had a quarrel with my father and your sister has broken me all up by returning my ring i want a little excitement to ease my nerves from elsie's incoherent talk i judge you are in danger if there's going to be a fight let me in ben took his hand you're the kind of man i'd like to have for a brother and i'll help you in love but as for war it's not your fight we don't need help at ten o'clock ben met the local den at their rendezvous under the cliff to prepare for the events of the night the forty members present were drawn up before him in double rank of twenty each brethren he said to them solemnly i have called you tonight to take a step from which there can be no retreat we are going to make a daring experiment of the utmost importance if there is a faint heart among you now is the time to retire we are with you cried the men there are laws of our race old before this republic was born in the souls of white freemen the fiat of fools has repealed on paper these laws your fathers who created this nation were first conspirators then revolutionists now patriots and saints i need to-night ten volunteers to lead the coming clansmen over this county and disarm every negro in it the men from north carolina cannot be recognized each of you must run this risk your absence from home to-night will be doubly dangerous for what will be done here at this negro armory under my command i ask of these ten men to ride their horses until dawn even unto death to ride for their god their native land and the womanhood of the south to each man who accepts this dangerous mission i offer for your bed the earth for your canopy the sky for your bread stones and when the flash of bayonets shall fling into your face from the square the challenge of martial law the protection i promise you is exile imprisonment and death let the ten men who accept these terms step forward four paces with a single impulse the whole double line of forty white and scarlet figures moved quickly forward four steps the leader shook hands with each man his voice throbbing with emotion as he said stand together like this men and armies will march and countermarch over the south in vain we will save the life of our people the ten guides selected by the grand dragon rode forward and each led a division of one hundred men through the ten townships of the county and successfully disarmed every negro before day without the loss of a life the remaining squadron of two hundred and fifty men from hambright accompanied by the grand titan in command of the province of western hill counties were led by ben cameron into piedmont as the waning moon rose between twelve and one o'clock they marched past stoneman's place on the way to the negro armory which stood on the opposite side of the street a block below the wild music of the beat of a thousand hoofs on the cobblestones of the street waked every sleeper the old commoner hobbled to his window and watched them pass his big hands fumbling nervously and his soul stirred to its depths the ghost-like shadowy columns moved slowly with a deliberate consciousness of power the scarlet circles on their breasts could be easily seen when one turned toward the house as could the big red letters k k k on each horse's flank in the center of the line waved from the gold-tipped spear the battle flag of the clan as they passed the brilliant lights burning at his gate old stoneman could see this standard plainly the huge black dragon with flaming eyes and tongue seemed a living thing crawling over the scarlet-tipped yellow cloud at the window above stood a little figure watching that banner of the dragon pass with aching heart phil stood at another smiling with admiration for their daring by george it stirs the blood to see it you can't crush men of that breed the watchers were not long in doubt as to what the raiders meant they deployed quickly around the armory a whistle rang its shrill cry and a volley of two hundred and fifty carbines and revolvers smashed every glass in the building the sentinel had already given the alarm and the drum was calling the startled negroes to their arms they returned the volley twice and for ten minutes were answered with the steady crack of two hundred and fifty guns the white flag appeared at the door and the firing ceased the negroes laid down their arms and surrendered 
all save three were allowed to go to their homes for the night and carry their wounded with them the three confederates in the crime of their captain were bound and led away in a few minutes the crash of a volley told their end the little white figure rapped at phil's door and placed a trembling hand on his arm phil she said softly please go to the hotel and stay until you know all that has happened until you know the full list of those killed and wounded i'll wait you understand as he stooped and kissed her he felt a hot tear roll down her cheek yes little sis i understand he answered end of book four chapter four Book Four, Chapter Five of *The Klansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Five: The Reign of the Klan. In quick succession, every county followed the example of Ulster, and the arms furnished the Negroes by the state and national governments were in the hands of the Klan. The League began to collapse in a panic of terror. A gale of chivalrous passion and high action, contagious and intoxicating, swept the white race. The moral, mental, and physical earthquake which followed the first assault on one of their daughters revealed the unity of the racial life of the people within the span of a week they had lived a century the spirit of the south like lightning had at last leaped forth half startled at itself its feet upon the ashes and the rags its hands tight gripped on the throat of tyrant thug and thief it was the resistless movement of a race not of any man or leader of men the secret weapon with which they struck was the most terrible and efficient in human history those pale hosts of white and scarlet horsemen they struck shrouded in a mantle of darkness and terror they struck where the power of resistance was weakest and the blow least suspected discovery or retaliation was impossible not a single disguise was ever penetrated all was planned and ordered as by destiny the accused were tried by secret tribunal sentenced without a hearing executed in the dead of night without warning mercy or appeal the movements of the clan were like clockwork without a word save the whistle of the night hawk the crack of his revolver and the hoof-beat of swift horses moving like figures in a dream and vanishing in mists and shadows the old club-footed puritan in his mad scheme of vengeance and party power had overlooked the covenanter the backbone of the south this man had just begun to fight his race had defied the crown of great britain a hundred years from the caves and wilds of scotland and ireland taught the english people how to slay a king and build a commonwealth and driven into exile into the wilderness of america led our revolution peopled the hills of the south and conquered the west as the young german patriots of eighteen twelve had organized the great struggle for their liberties under the noses of the garrisons of napoleon so ben cameron had met the leaders of his race in nashville tennessee within the picket lines of thirty-five thousand hostile troops and in the ruins of an old homestead discussed and adopted the ritual of the invisible empire within a few months this empire overspread a territory larger than modern europe in the approaching election it was reaching out its daring white hands to tear the fruits of victory from twenty million victorious conquerors the triumph at which they aimed was one of incredible grandeur they had risen to snatch power out of defeat and death under their clan leadership the southern people had suddenly developed the courage of the lion the cunning of the fox and the deathless faith of religious enthusiasts society was fused in the white heat of one sublime thought and beat with the pulse of a single will of the grand wizard of the clan of memphis women and children had eyes and saw not ears and heard not over four thousand disguises for men and horses were made by the women of the south and not one secret ever passed their lips with magnificent audacity infinite patience and remorseless zeal a conquered people were struggling to turn their own weapon against their conqueror and beat his brains out with the bludgeon he had placed in the hands of their former slaves behind the tragedy of reconstruction stood the remarkable man whose iron will alone had driven these terrible measures through the chaos of passion 
corruption and bewilderment which followed the first assassination of an american president he had leaned on his window in this village of the south and watched in speechless rage the struggle at that negro armory he felt for the first time the foundations sinking beneath his feet as he saw the black cowards surrender in terror noted the indifference and cool defiance with which those white horsemen rode and shot he knew that he had collided with the ultimate force which his whole scheme had overlooked he turned on his big club foot from the window clenched his fist and muttered but i'll hang that man for this deed if it's the last act of my life the morning brought dismay to the negro the carpet-bagger and the scallywag of ulster a peculiar freak of weather in the early morning added to their terror the sun rose clear and bright except for a slight fog that floated from the river valley increasing the roar of the falls about nine o'clock the huge black shadow suddenly rushed over piedmont from the west and in a moment the town was shrouded in twilight the cries of birds were hushed and chickens went to roost as in a total eclipse of the sun knots of people gathered on the streets and gazed uneasily at the threatening skies hundreds of negroes began to sing and shout and pray while sensible people feared a cyclone or a cloudburst a furious downpour of rain was swiftly followed by sunshine and the negroes rose from their knees shouting with joy to find that the end of the world had after all been postponed but that the end of their brief reign in the white man's land had come but few of them doubted the events of the night were sufficiently eloquent the movement of the clouds in sympathy was unnecessary old stoneman sent for lynch and found that he had fled to columbia he sent for the only lawyer in town whom the lieutenant governor had told him could be trusted the lawyer was polite but his refusal to undertake the prosecution of any alleged member of the clan was emphatic i am a sinful man sir he said with a smile besides i prefer to live on general principles i'll pay you well urged the old man and if you secure the conviction of ben cameron the man we believe to be the head of this clan i'll give you ten thousand dollars the lawyer was whittling on a piece of pine meditatively that's a big lot of money in these hard times i'd like to own it but i'm afraid it wouldn't be good at the bank on the other side i prefer the green fields of south carolina to those of eden my harp isn't in tune stoneman snorted in disgust will you ask the mayor to call to see me at once we ain't got none was the laconic answer what do you mean haven't you heard what happened to his honor last night no the clan called to see him went on the lawyer with a quizzical look at three a m rather early for a visit of state they gave him forty-nine lashes on his bare back and persuaded him that the climate of piedmont didn't agree with him his honor mayor bizzel left this morning with his negro wife and brood of mulatto children for his home the slums of cleveland ohio we are deprived of his illustrious example and he may not be a wiser man than when he came but he's a much sadder one stoneman dismissed the even-tempered member of the bar and wired lynch to return immediately to piedmont he determined to conduct the prosecution of ben cameron in person with the aid of the lieutenant governor he succeeded in finding a man who would dare to swear out a warrant against him as a preliminary skirmish he was charged with the violation of the statutory laws of the united states relating to reconstruction and arraigned before a commissioner against elsie's agonizing protest old stoneman appeared at the courthouse to conduct the prosecution in the absence of the united states marshal the warrant had been placed in the hands of the sheriff returnable at ten o'clock on the morning fixed for the trial the new sheriff of ulster was no less a personage than uncle alec who had resigned his seat in the house to accept the more profitable one of high sheriff of the county there was a long delay in beginning the trial at ten thirty not a single witness summoned had appeared nor had the prisoner seen fit to honor the court with his presence old stoneman sat fumbling his hands in nervous sullen rage while phil looked on with amusement send for the sheriff he growled to the commissioner in a moment alec appeared bowing humbly and politely to every white man he passed he bent halfway to the floor before the commissioner and said mars ben be here in a minute sir he's a-eatin his breakfast i run along ahead stoneman's face was a thundercloud as he scrambled to his feet and glared at alec mars or ben did you say mars or ben who's he alec bowed low again the young colonel sir mars or ben cameron 
and you the sheriff of this county trotting along in front to make the way smooth for your prisoner yes sir is that the way you escort prisoners before the court dem kind of prisoners yes sir why didn't you walk beside him alec grinned from ear to ear and bowed very low he say something to me sir and what did he say alex shook his head and laughed i hates to insinuate to the coat sir what did he say to you thundered stoneman he, he say he say if i walk alongside of him he'd knock a hell out of me sir indeed yes sir and i speck he would said alec insinuatingly la he's a gemman sir he is he tell me he'd come right on he be here show stoneman whispered to lynch turning with a look of contempt to alec and said mr sheriff you interest me will you be kind enough to explain to this court what has happened to you lately to so miraculously change your manners alec glanced around the room nervously i seed something a vision sir a vision are you given to visions no sir this here was a show sure enough vision i was a feeling bad all day yesterday soon in the morning as i was going along the road i see a big black bird or sitting on the fence he flop his wings look right at me and say corpse 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 alec's voice dropped to a whisper and last night the ku kluxes come to see me sir stoneman lifted his beetling brows that's interesting we are searching for information on that subject yes sir they was spirits riding white horses with flowing white robes and big blood-red eyes the horses was twenty feet high and some of the spirits was higher than this coat house they was all ball-headed except right on the top where there was a straight blaze of fire shot up in the air ten foot high what did they say to you they say that if i didn't resign the sheriff's office go back to farming and behave myself they had a job waiting for me in hell sir and shows you bone they was right from there of course sneered the old commoner yes sir it's just like i tell you one of em make me fetch him a drink of water i carry two bucketfuls to him before i get done and i swear to god he'd drink it all right there for my eyes he say it was powerful dry down below sir and then i feel something bust loose inside of me and i disremember all that come to pass i made a jump for the river bank and the next i knowed i was a pullin for the other show i's a powerful good swimmer sir but i never get across the creek before as quick as i got over the river last night and you think of going back to farming i done begin plowing this morning master don't you call me marster yelled the old man are you the sheriff of this county alec laughed loudly no sir that's a joke i ain't nothing but a plain nigger i wants peace judge evidently we need a new sheriff that's what i tell him sir this morning and i just flings myself on the ignorance of the coat phil laughed aloud and his father's colorless eyes began to spit cold poison about what time do you think your master colonel cameron will honor us with his presence he asked alec again the sheriff bowed he's a coming right now like i told you he's a gentleman sir ben walked briskly into the room and confronted the commissioner without apparently noticing his presence stoneman said in the absence of witnesses we accept the discharge of this warrant pending developments ben turned on his heel pressed phil's hand as he passed through the crowd and disappeared the old commoner drove to the telegraph office and sent a message of more than a thousand words to the white house a copy of which the operator delivered to ben cameron within an hour president grant next morning issued a proclamation declaring the nine scotch irish hill counties of south carolina in a state of insurrection ordered an army corps of five thousand men to report there for duty pending the further necessity of martial law and the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus end of book four chapter five Book Four, Chapter Six of *The Klansmen: An Historical Romance of the Ku Klux Klan* by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Six: The Counterstroke. 
from the hour he had watched the capture of the armory old stoneman felt in the air a current against him which was electric as if the dead had heard the cry of the clansmen's greeting risen and rallied to their pale ranks the daring campaign these men were waging took his breath they were going not only to defeat his delegation to congress but send their own to take their seats reinforced by the enormous power of a suppressed negro vote the blow was so sublime in its audacity he laughed in secret admiration while he raved and cursed the army corps took possession of the hill counties quartering from five to six hundred regulars at each courthouse but the mischief was done the state was on fire the eighty thousand rifles with which the negroes had been armed were now in the hands of their foes a white rifle club was organized in every town village and hamlet they attended the public meetings with their guns drilled in front of the speakers stands yelled hooted hissed cursed and jeered at the orators who dared to champion or apologize for negro rule at night the hoof-beat of squadrons of pale horsemen and the crack of their revolvers struck terror to the heart of every negro carpet-bagger and scallywag there was a momentary lull in the excitement which stoneman mistook for fear at the appearance of the troops he had the governor appoint a white sheriff a young scallywag from the mountains who was a noted moonshiner and desperado he arrested over a hundred leading men in the county charging them with complicity in the killing of the three members of the african guard and instructed the judge and clerk of the court to refuse bail and commit them to jail under military guard to his amazement the prisoners came into piedmont armed and mounted they paid no attention to the deputy sheriffs who were supposed to have them in charge they deliberately formed the line under ben cameron's direction and he led them in a parade through the streets the five hundred u s regulars who were camped on the river bank were westerners ben led his squadron of armed prisoners in front of this camp and took them through the evolutions of cavalry with the precision of veterans the soldiers dropped their games and gathered laughing to watch them the drill ended with a double rank charge at the river embankment when they drew every horse on his haunches on the brink firing a volley with a single crash a wild cheer broke from the soldiers and the officers rushed from their tents ben wheeled his men galloped in front of the camp drew them up at dress parade and saluted a low word of command from a trooper and the westerners quickly formed in ranks returned the salute and cheered the officers rushed up cursing and drove the men back to their tents the horsemen laughed fired a volley in the air cheered and galloped back to the courthouse the court was glad to get rid of them there was no question raised over technicalities in the making out bail bonds the clerk wrote the names of imaginary bondsmen as fast as his pen could fly while the perspiration stood in beads on his red forehead another telegram from old stoneman to the white house and the writ of habeas corpus was suspended and martial law proclaimed enraged beyond measure at the salute from his troops he had two companies of negro regulars sent from columbia and they camped in the courthouse square he determined to make a desperate effort to crush the fierce spirit before which his forces were being driven like chafe he induced bizzle to return from cleveland with his negro wife and children he was escorted to the city hall and reinstalled as mayor by a full force of seven hundred troops and a negro guard placed around his house stoneman had lynch run an excursion from the black belt and brought a thousand negroes to attend a final rally at piedmont he placarded the town with posters on which were printed the civil rights bill and the proclamation of the president declaring martial law ben watched this day dawn with nervous dread he had passed a sleepless night riding in person to every den of the clan and issuing positive orders that no white man should come to piedmont the clash with the authority of the united states he had avoided from the first as a matter of principle it was essential to his success that his men should commit no act of desperation which would imperil his plans above all he wished to avoid a clash with old stoneman personally the arrival of the big excursion was the signal for a revival of negro insolence which had been planned the men brought from the eastern part of the state were selected for the purpose they marched over the town yelling and singing a crowd of them half drunk formed themselves three abreast and rushed the sidewalks pushing every white man woman and child into the street 
they met phil on his way to the hotel and pushed him into the gutter he said nothing crossed the street bought a revolver loaded it and put it in his pocket he was not popular with the negroes and he had been shot at twice on his way from the mills at night the whole affair of this rally over which his father meant to preside filled him with disgust and he was in an ugly mood lynch's speech was bold bitter and incendiary and at its close the drunken negro troops from the local garrison began to slouch through the streets two and two looking for trouble at the close of the speaking stoneman called the officer in command of these troops and said major i wish this rally today to be a proclamation of the supremacy of law and the enforcement of the equality of every man under law your troops are entitled to the rights of white men i understand the hotel table has been free today to the soldiers from the camp on the river they are returning the courtesy extended to the criminals who drilled before them send two of your black troops down for dinner and see that it is served i wish an example for the state it will be a dangerous performance sir the major protested the old commoner furrowed his brow have you been instructed to act under my orders i have sir said the officer saluting then do as i tell you snapped stoneman ben cameron had kept indoors all day and dined with fifty of the western troopers whom he had identified as leading in the friendly demonstration to his men margaret who had been busy with mrs cameron entertaining these soldiers was seated in the dining-room alone eating her dinner while phil waited impatiently in the parlor the guests had all gone when two big negro troopers fighting drunk walked into the hotel they went to the water cooler and drank ostentatiously thrusting their thick lips coated with filth far into the coconut dipper while the dirty hand grasped its surface they pushed the dining-room door open and suddenly flopped down beside margaret she attempted to rise and cried in rage how dare you black brutes one of them threw his arm around her chair thrust his face into hers and said with a laugh don't hurry my beauty stay and take dinner with us margaret again attempted to rise and screamed as phil rushed into the room with drawn revolver one of the negroes fired at him missed and the next moment dropped dead with a bullet through his heart the other leaped across the table and through the open window margaret turned confronting both phil and ben with revolvers in their hands and fainted ben hurried phil out the back door and persuaded him to fly man you must go we must not have a riot here today there's no telling what will happen a disturbance now and my men will swarm into town tonight for god's sake go until things are quiet but i tell you i'll face it i'm not afraid said phil quietly no but i am urged ben these two hundred negroes are armed and drunk their officers may not be able to control them and they may lay their hands on you go 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 you must go the train is due in fifteen minutes he half lifted him on a horse tied behind the hotel leaped on another galloped to the big flag station two miles out of town and put him on the northbound train stay in charlotte until i wire for you was ben's parting injunction he turned his horse's head from mcallister's sent the two boys with all speed to the cyclops of each of the ten township dens with positive orders to disregard all wild rumors from piedmont and keep every man out of town for two days as he rode back he met a squad of mounted white regulars who arrested him the trooper's companion had sworn positively that he was the man who killed the negro within thirty minutes he was tried by drumhead court-martial and sentenced to be shot end of book four chapter six book four chapter seven of the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry chapter seven the snare of the fowler sweet was the secret joy of old stoneman over the fate of ben cameron his death sentence would strike terror to his party and his prompt execution on the morning of the election but two days off would turn the tide save the state and rescue his daughter from a hated alliance he determined to bar the last way of escape 
he knew the clan would attempt a rescue and stop at no means fair or foul short of civil war afraid of the loyalty of the white battalions quartered in piedmont he determined to leave immediately for spartanburg order an exchange of garrisons and when the death warrant was returned from headquarters place its execution in the hands of a stranger to whom appeal would be vain he knew such an officer in the spartanburg post a man of fierce vindictive nature once court-martialed for cruelty who hated every southern white man with mortal venom he would put him in command of the death watch he hired a fast team and drove across the county with all speed doubly anxious to get out of town before elsie discovered the tragedy and appealed to him for mercy her tears and agony would be more than he could endure she would stay indoors on account of the crowds and he would not be missed until evening when safely beyond her reach when phil arrived at charlotte he found an immense crowd at the bulletin board in front of the observer office reading the account of the piedmont tragedy to his horror he learned of the arrest trial and sentence of ben for the deed which he had done he rushed to the office of the division superintendent of the piedmont airline railroad revealed his identity told him the true story of the tragedy and begged for a special to carry him back the superintendent who was a clansman not only agreed but within an hour had the special ready and two cars filled with stern-looking men to accompany him phil asked no questions he knew what it meant the train stopped at gastonia and king's mountain and took on a hundred more men the special pulled into piedmont at dusk phil ran to the commandant and asked for an interview with ben alone for what purpose sir the officer asked phil resorted to a ruse knowing the commandant to be unaware of any difference of opinion between him and his father i hold a commission to obtain a confession from the prisoner which may save his life by destroying the ku klux klan he was admitted at once and the guard ordered to withdraw until the interview ended phil took ben cameron's place exchanging hat and coat and wrote a note to his father telling in detail the truth and asked for his immediate interference deliver that and i'll be out of here in two hours he said as he placed the note in ben's hand i'll go straight to the house was the quick reply the exchange of the southerner's slouch hat and prince albert for phil's derby and short coat completely fooled the guard in the dim light the men were as much alike as twins except the shade of difference in the color of their hair he passed the sentinel without a challenge and walked rapidly toward stoneman's house on the way he was astonished to meet five hundred soldiers just arrived on a special from spartanburg amazed at the unexpected movement he turned and followed them back to the jail they halted in front of the building he had just vacated and their commander handed an official document to the officer in charge the guard was changed and a cordon of soldiers encircled the prison the piedmont garrison had received notice by wire to move to spartanburg and ben heard the beat of their drums already marching to board the special he pressed forward and asked an interview with the captain in command the answer came with a brutal oath i have been warned against all the tricks and lies this town can hatch the commander of the death watch will permit no interview receive no visitors hear no appeal and allow no communication with the prisoner until after the execution you can announce this to whom it may concern but you've got the wrong man you have no right to execute him said ben excitedly i'll risk it he answered with a sneer great god ben cried beneath his breath the old fool has entrapped his son in the net he spread for me. End of Book Four, Chapter Seven.